Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. Live on the phone with me today, I have Marsha Ballinger in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Marsha is the co-founder and principal at Ballinger Leafblad, an executive search firm focused on serving civic clients, including foundations, nonprofits, and higher education institutions. She's also the co-author of the 20-Minute Networking Meeting. Marsha, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. It's so great to talk with you. I was mentioning before we got started, you work in a really special area, being focused specifically on civic clients and uh, sort of on the, the recruiting side, which is really interesting. So I'm so excited to get your perspective. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, I mentioned uh, when we got started that you're also the co-author of the 20-Minute Networking Meeting, and this is such an important topic. Help us to understand what is the 20-Minute Networking Meeting? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, um, as you mentioned, am in executive recruiting. I've been in retained executive search for a couple of decades now, and many people seek to network with recruiters as part of their job transition. And I would be no different, and over the years, I've received many, many requests to network, and I've said yes to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And over the years have had um, what is now thousands of networking meetings. And after I reached about the 1,000 networking meeting mark, I had a pretty stark realization. And the realization was that most of those 1,000 networking meetings didn't go very well. Mm. From, from the, you know, the other person was hoping to make a good impression. They were hoping to um, have a meeting such that I might recommend them to somebody else or put a star in their, next to their name in our database or whatever the case might be. And they certainly didn't accomplish that. And after, after I had that realization, hmm, I mean, that's not good, right? that 950 out of 1,000 uh, weren't too good. Definitely. I started, I started watching for, uh, you know, I'm not a very fast thinker if it takes you 1,000 meetings, but be that as it may, I started watching for what the people did who did it right. Okay. And the people who left my office after a networking meeting where I thought, I am going to forward that resume to my fellow board members on the HR executive forum, or I am going to walk this down the hall and share it with one of my partners, or gosh, you know, three weeks later, that person did come to mind at a cocktail party when I heard about an opening or whatever the case might be. What did those people do differently than the majority? And so I sort of watched and scratched it down and cobbled it together and refined it. And then I took that to other people that were sort of heavy targets for networking meeting requests, you know, mm -hmm. CEOs and other search executives and partners at law firms and accounting firms and said, you know what, how does this look to you? And if someone were to come in and do this, uh, what would be your reaction? And based on all of that, uh, I crafted the 20-minute networking meeting in which you know, I literally say, in your first two minutes, do this, in your next minute, do that, and the next several minutes, do this. And I describe exactly how to do what I think um, is the most effective networking meeting from my side of the desk, the recipient of that networking meeting, and wrote it down and expanded upon it and um, turned it into a book. It is now in three editions. One is the original executive edition, probably appropriate for most of uh, the participants in this podcast. There is also an edition that's targeted for college students, uh, because so many people said to us after reading the book, gee, my kid needs this. Um, 
they need to network. They just got out of college, and, you know, they're looking down at their cell phone, uh, that type of thing. Uh, so we redid a version for new college grads, and then we have a third version for more um, mid-level, early-level professionals. So all that said, um, we made the decision that 20 minutes is all you need uh, to have a great meeting that accomplishes your objectives and uh, carved out exactly what to do in that meeting. Oh, that's great. So what are, what's one of the things that you think someone who's successful in the 20-minute meeting does that's different than the rest of the, the other people? Well, at the end of the day, what a person does at, at the 20-minute networking meeting is behave in such a way that they get the result they seek. And, you know, I, I use the term, they've created an evangelist. Mm -hmm. uh, the word could be an ambassador. When you leave that networking meeting, you've had one shot with that person, typically. Um, and at the end of that, uh, will they take some sort of action on your behalf when you're not there? Will they remember you a month later when someone talks about an opportunity? Will they share your information forward? Will they... Uh, you know, want to stay in touch with you? Uh, will they give you a name of someone else in their field and, and vouch for you? Will they take action on your behalf? If you have done the meeting right, you've created an evangelist. And we all, I mean, there's some research that shows that we all need about 100 evangelists in our life to mm -hmm. run a business, have a strong career, whatever the case may be. And networking is one way that we sort of build up this core of evangelists. But what people do sort of tactically in a 20-minute networking meeting that's different is they uh, come in significantly better prepared, mm -hmm. albeit uh, for a shorter meeting. Number one, they take less than half as much time as the 60-minute networking meeting, which mm -hmm. is never effective. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk almost not at all about themselves. They've got their own narrative down to less than a minute, mm -hmm. which is all you need. Uh, they come prepared with really cogent questions for the other person, um, and they, they comport themselves in a way that the other person would be proud to uh, refer them. So all of those things, and as such, when they leave the meeting, they have uh, added to their cadre of evangelists or ambassadors on their behalf. Absolutely. It's interesting that you mentioned that they kind of have their own personal narrative down. Um, when I've worked with folks, the only negative feedback I ever hear from someone who's had a networking meeting with the, the job seeker is that the person wasn't able to quickly and easily explain about themselves. So when they would kind of ask the tell me about yourself, the person wasn't able to very clearly develop or deliver their elevator pitch. So it's interesting that you mention that as something that people do well who are effective at these meetings. In, in my 20-minute networking meeting model, I allow one minute for mm -hmm. the person to give an overview of themselves. And it's probably better at 30 seconds, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to get that granular. So, <laughs> you know, honestly, if my partner and I, you know, had a, I love the guy like a brother, but if we blew up and I was out talking to other search firms, let's just say, and I were sitting down with someone, I would say, you know, thanks again, et cetera, et cetera. I've got 22 years in search, half of it in corporate generalist search, and half of it focused on the nonprofit sector, uh, recruited every type of position there is. Prior to that, I worked in HR, uh, mostly in OD. Avocationally, I'm on the board of this, that, and the other, and I've got a doctorate in this. You know, how long did that take? It took about 18 seconds. Right. And nobody really needs to know more than that for mm -hmm. the purpose of that meeting. Right. Especially since I'm going to probably be sliding my resume or my one-pager across the table as I'm speaking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great, great point. Well, so one question I hear a lot from people who are thinking about doing a 20-minute networking meeting is, you know, what should I really expect to get out of that meeting? You know, because it's such, it feels uncomfortable if, if we've never done it before. 
And what should our expectation be going in? What should we think that we're going to be getting out of it? Yeah, and, and that's a phenomenal question because that's the big paradox of networking. And, you know, it is uncomfortable, right? So that's the, the playing field is we're all sort of walking into an uncomfortable space. And, um, you know, before I even mention the paradox, uh, I, I will say a bit more about networking being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, we avoid it like the plague. And I think part of the reason that executives avoid networking, which is essentially, you know, talking to another person and running a little simple meeting, which we all can do, right? Why is it uncomfortable? Um, it's uncomfortable because I think we are really used to more of a sort of quid pro quo where mm-hmm. I'm giving as much as I'm taking, mm-hmm. and most, many of us aren't too good at asking. And right. we sort of feel when we go into a networking meeting that I'm down a peg, or I'm groveling, or I'm asking. And part of the reason that I uh, wrote the 20-minute networking meeting, and part of what I noticed that the best networkers do differently, is they don't run networking meetings where they're groveling, and they they give as much as they ask. Mm -hmm. And if you have a networking meeting model where uh, you're coming in prepared to give as much as get, uh, you've got questions that are really provocative and you've got this interesting, fun discussion that doesn't go on very long, um, you don't feel as down a peg. But if I, honestly, I'd never have a networking meeting. If I felt like, cheapers, I've got to go in and talk for 60 minutes about myself and then I need to ask <laughs> them to the world, I'd never do one either. Mm-hmm. But if I go in and I've got a, I, I approach it super professionally, I'm, I've got really tight, provocative, interesting questions, I come prepared to give back to them, and um, I follow up in a way that upholds them and enhances them in their own network. Mm -hmm. I don't feel so bad about that. So part of the reason of having a model is it makes me feel quite more comfortable with the process. But to get back to your question about what should I expect out of a networking meeting, you know, should I expect a job? Um, That is the paradox of networking. And why should I network? Well, you should network because the most recent statistic I heard from the world's largest outplacement firm is that 90% of all professional jobs are landed through networking. Mm. Not recruiters, not online apps. I actually talked to, uh, to a group yesterday, and one gentleman stood up and said, I sent out 150 LinkedIn applications, mm-hmm. and I heard back from one. Right. <laughs> Statistically, that's about, what, that's about right. So um, 90% of all professional jobs are landed through networking. Mm-hmm. If I was in transition, I wouldn't do anything else. I would just network. Mm-hmm. If, I'm a, you know, if I'm playing the odds, I'm not a gambler, but if I were, uh, I would spend all my time on networking because that's where, statistically speaking, I'm going to find my next job. Having said that, in any one individual meeting, you are not going to find a job. Right. Any one person that you set up a networking meeting with, the, there's a 0.001% chance that that person has a job that you are a really great fit for at that moment. Mm-hmm. I'm in search, and that's all I do is I have jobs. And, you know, in my 22-year career, only once has a networker called me you know, and he was a VP in some chemical substrates, and oh my gosh, you can't believe it, I'm working on a search like that. Right. It, it's very, very rare. So the answer is never go into a networking meeting asking for a job mm-hmm. or saying, do you know of a job or can you get me a job? Mm-hmm. They don't have a job. You are there to do three things, in my estimation. Yeah. You are there to... Um, Ask them some questions and learn something. You know, hey, Marsha, I see you've got the SPHR. Do you think I should go for that certification? Or, Michelle, I see that you have been in financial uh, positions both in higher ed, and then you transitioned into public accounting. Can I ask you about that trend? You know, you're you're there with some really particular questions that you sincerely want to know from that person. Um, You want to expand your network Mm -hmm. and say, who else do you know that I might talk with? 
And you're there to do it in such a way that you make a great impression. Right. And, and um, that leads to the activity, you know, the, the job getting takes place after you've left their office. Right. You know, when they call their friend, when they run into someone at a little league game next week, that's when the job getting takes place. So any individual discrete networking meeting will never have a job for you. Mm -hmm. And to ask for one is sort of ridiculous. But in the whole totality of how you spend your transition time, networking is, by a mile, uh, the most likely way you're going to find your next job. I love that. And I love the the statistic that you quoted. Um, You know, it reminds me of a conversation I had earlier this week, actually, with a job seeker who is new to a city. And I was really excited about we've got a network let's you got to get out there and meet some people and the person was like great great that's a great idea now which websites do I apply online (laughs) you know and I'm like well you can look at these but let's focus on the networking strategy and the person was like okay sure sure but why is it that I applied to this one organization and they didn't write me back like what do you think was wrong with my application (laughs) and I was like networking let's focus on the networking (laughs) I mean you know you you are so right, and here's why. Excuse me. Here's here's why networking leads to ninety percent of all jobs. When you send in a application online, you might be one of two hundred people. Right. Right. If you apply to a search firm, you know I'm being paid a small fortune to nose out the best of the best, most of whom are not looking, right. and I'm going to call a couple hundred people. Mm-hmm. If you get networked into a position. You, in many cases, are the only one, Mm -hmm. and you may get interviewed before it goes out to a search, before it gets posted, and all of a sudden you're a pool of one, Right. and you nab the job before having to go through all those steps. That's why it's 90%. No, I totally agree. I I always tell people, if you only apply online, you're pretty much guaranteeing that you're going to be last in line, because Mm -hmm. the hiring manager will try to think, do I know anyone for this job, or... Do I know anyone who knows anyone? Like by the time they're sifting through the hundreds of resumes that came in through the internet, I mean, they're desperate. And so they're probably not going to pay much attention at at all to those unless, to me, unless they haven't found someone through a search firm or through someone they know or some other personal network connection. It's just... It's just not going to happen. <laughs> so, uh-huh. so anyway, I'm convinced. But so as we're trying to uh, prepare for this meeting to make it the most effective, you know, what are some of the things that we can do? You mentioned um, it sounds like preparing questions, but what what do you recommend that people do to use that time effectively? Yeah, I think that is a, a key point, and. I have one rule about preparing for a 20-minute networking meeting, and my rule is this. Don't ask the other person anything that you can easily find out about them on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And I would say by far the most common question that I get asked when people come in to meet with me in a networking meeting is, so what do you do here at Balance Release Blast? Mm. Now, and then the person later in the meeting talks about, you know, how planful they are and how, you know, their executive judgment. And I'm thinking, uh, no. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do not ask any question of that person that you can easily find on the Internet. And so the way that I think about it is that person is giving you the incredible gift of time. Mm -hmm. What would I do with 20 minutes, 30 minutes with this person. Looking at their LinkedIn bio, look at their website, track down boards that they sit on, look at things that they write or attend or belong to. Why do I want to ask that person? And sometimes it starts with a statement, such as, uh, George, I see that you're a really active member of FEI. Mm -hmm. Do you think that I should connect with FEI at this point? And if so, uh, what committees do you think I should pursue? You know, that's a specific question for George because you see that he's on the board of FEI. Um, as opposed to, George, what do you do in your accounting firm? Mm-hmm. Um, 
and and so find those unique things about that person that you wonder about that could be very helpful to you um, and ask for their perspective. So I recommend going into every networking meeting with three specific questions for that person Mm -hmm. that you have derived from what you've learned about them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes sense. So with regards to that preparation, the one question I get pretty frequently is, well, gosh, isn't that weird to look up someone's LinkedIn profile? Won't that make them uncomfortable to know that I was kind of stalking them on the Internet? What do you say to someone no. that's worried about that? I mean, I really get that I, question a lot. <laughs> I think, um, no, we are in a LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, online environment, I think your preparedness by looking at someone's LinkedIn profile, I mean, if you don't want to look at their LinkedIn profile, look at their online bio on their website. Mm -hmm. Why do organizations have websites? Well, we hope that we drive traffic to our website. (laughs) So to go to someone's website and say, you know, I, I love your logo, and I love the vibe, and I love the feel, and I see that you are involved in, uh, you know, dressage horse judging or, you know, whatever it might be, um, we love that. Mm-hmm. It, it, it certainly beats plopping down in my office and saying, tell me about the economy or what do you guys do here at Balance Your Leaf Lab. Mm-hmm. That's pretty darn frustrating. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, one of the women that I tested by concept with um, is a business owner here in the Twin Cities, and she said that when people set up networking meetings with her, she sits down, starts things off, um, and the person invariably asks a question like, so what do you people do here at uh, Smith Jones and Associates? <laughs> and she says, did you go to my website? And the person says, no. And she says, why not? <gasps> wow. And that's the rest of us feel that way, but she's brave enough to say it. Right, right, uh, right. <laughs> you know, would you go into any other business meeting ill-prepared when your career depends on it? Mm-hmm. No. How do you prepare for this? You want to ask thought-provoking, unique, special questions that dignify the individual you're talking to and the time that they're giving you, and asking how's the economy and so what does your company do uh, does not. So uh, the thought-provoking questions that you get from LinkedIn or bio or what boards they're on or they spoke at a trade association honors the expertise that they bring to the table. And that's you know, presumably what you're looking to tap into. Well, you make a good point that they're putting that information on the Internet so that you'll look at it. <laughs> it's, not, yeah. it's not a secret that it's there. Also, I'm curious, you mentioned um, the, the person that you spoke with, and, and I'm sure you speak to people every single day that are in a similar situation who are uh, approached by job seekers who are asking for this 20-minute meeting. How should we ask for the meeting? Like, what's the most effective way to do it? Yeah, The best way to ask for a 20, I think nowadays, it has sort of gone from why don't you call the person, and now I do suggest why don't you email the person. Mm -hmm. So I suggest sending a gracious email, and we're playing odds, remember? You send out 100 networking requests over the course of a few months, you know, 92 will get back to you, right? So we're going to expect... not every single person is able to network with us. Some are on sabbatical or out of the country or whatever. Right. But we're sending an email, and the subject line is referred to you by Angela Copeland. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Or, you know, Chief Marketing Officer Candidate referred by Angela C. Or something like that. Mm-hmm. And in the email, uh, you know, Dear Marsha, I was referred to you by Angela Copeland. Uh, I am a Chief Marketing Officer in the uh, plastics industry and seeking a new opportunity. Angela thought that you and I would uh, connect because of this, that, or the other reason. Anything you can say about Angela, you know, Angela mentioned that the two of you have attended leadership conferences together and, and uh, 
you know, how the two of you laughed when you ran into the such and so. You know, anything you can do to add color to that relationship, mm-hmm. uh, etc., is helpful. So make the relationship. It's from Angela. You know, show that you and Angela are well connected. Show that Angela and I are well connected. Uh, paragraph one. Paragraph two, I would sincerely appreciate the opportunity to meet with you for no more than 20 minutes. I will gladly come to your office and bring you a coffee beverage of your choice <laughs> uh, on any day that is uh, convenient for you in the next several weeks. You would be shocked at how many people rec- contact me for networking meetings and want time. You know, I'll get a, co- a contact on a Wednesday and they want time yet that week. Oh, I know. Gosh, that drives me crazy. Who it is, I will never take those meetings. Right. It could be the CEO of the biggest company in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. could be the governor of the state. I will not take that meeting. It's so disrespectful. It's so disrespectful. So, or or don't say, I feel it would be beneficial for you to meet with me. I get a lot of those, too. Gosh, that's... So we're not going to do that, but we're going we're gonna to uphold the connection between Angela and myself. Mm-hmm. I'm going to talk about the connection between Angela and the other. I'm going to say I'm looking for 20 to 30 minutes. The day of your choice in the next several weeks, I will come to your office. I'll bring you the coffee of your choice. I sincerely look forward to meeting with you. Uh, attached is my resume or bio or one page for additional information. Hmm. The second that you hit send... You send Angela a note and say, you know, thanks again uh, for the uh, for the connection to Lisa. I just sent her an email. I hope we have an opportunity to connect in the next month or so. When you hear back from Lisa, and she sets it up for three weeks from now, you immediately, uh, again, ping back Angela. Thanks again, Angela. So great to meet with you. Lisa and I are set for three weeks from now. And Lisa, in her email, uh, mentioned that you were the best boss she ever had. And, and so part of what you're doing is you are enhancing, tightening Lisa and Angela's relationship mm-hmm. in the process. That's how you get the meeting. That is such fantastic advice. I mean, I, I've never heard anyone put it quite so clearly. So <laughs> I'm so glad I asked you that question. <laughs> Um, When people are preparing to send these emails that you mentioned, the question I get almost every time is just, gosh, am I not going to be bothering that person? Won't they think I'm a pest? Like, isn't it going to be inconvenient for them? What do you tell someone if they ask you this question, if if they're worried? Yeah. Well, you know what? Sure, they are a pest. But... (laughs) You know, when they were employed, didn't they take meetings Mm -hmm. from people that were looking? You know, karma, if you never took a networking meeting from anyone else, you know, um, maybe you're not getting takers now. But, you know, this is part of life. This is part of business. Uh, People refer people to me, and I refer people back to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, I grow my network in all sorts of different ways, and we all do, and we all live and breathe and grow in part through the network that we have. So there's going to be a small percentage of people who don't have the time to ever take networking meetings. Eh, so be it. Uh, there are people that don't have an affinity for taking networking meetings. Eh, so be it. You know, we're shooting for 90%. Mm-hmm. And so um, the best thing we can do to not be a pest is to, number one, take the most minimal amount of time. Mm-hmm. Number two, meet on their turf. Mm-hmm. I, I have people frequently ask for networking meetings and ask me to meet them close to their house, and they're mm-hmm. nearly an hour away from my office. Um, we don't do that. You know, we go to the other person's <laughs> office at the time of their choice. We bring them a beverage. Uh, we keep it to 20 minutes, we come prepared to help them, Mm -hmm. you know, if they're an attorney in private practice, maybe you bring some people who might need legal services, or you bring a white paper that you've printed off the internet from the day before on how to run a small law firm, or, you know, you've come prepared with with something thoughtful to give in return, Um, and, and at the end of the day, 
every single thing about the 20-minute networking meeting is meant to minimize the peskiness Mm -hmm. factor. And most people, if you do it well, feel really good when you leave. Mm -hmm. And so you're not a pest. You are a pest, but you're not. Right. (laughs) Well, I I totally, I love that. And the other thing that you mentioned a couple of different times, which I think is very important, you mentioned that some people don't have an affinity to networking meetings, or some people may be on sabbatical, or some people may have something else going on. But what you didn't say was, well, they don't like you, (laughs) or they have negative feelings towards you. So you're kind of putting out there that if you don't hear back from that 10%, don't take it personally. It's probably more due to that other person's situation or maybe their opinion of networking meetings than you personally. Yeah, that is absolutely true. Salespeople don't cry if they don't get 100%. Most mm-hmm. salespeople are happy with 10%, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and this is, this is no different. We're asking people at a moment in time, a year ago they may have been able to say yes, next year, that, but at this moment they might not. Mm-hmm. So the best thing we can do is make connections. I, I tend to take networking meetings. You know, of course I'll take, you know, my siblings and my cousins and my best friends and my former coworkers and people I know really well and et cetera. Um, so, so certainly start your own networking meet, meetings with the people that you used to work with and that you're on boards with and your neighbors and people in your kids' parents of your kids' friends and, you know, all sorts of other things like that, mm-hmm. you know, start with your own inner circle, but um, also realize that most jobs are going to be obtained when you're in the second and third tiers out from your inner circle, and it's not so much meeting with Angela, who's your best friend, but it's meeting with Angela's friend, mm-hmm. and Angela's friend's friend, mm-hmm. and that's the skill of... Um, Making a request. And, and so that's part of the other thing about looking on LinkedIn. If somebody looks on LinkedIn and they see, um, you know, I'll just, I guess I'll be honest. Uh, if you look on my LinkedIn, you'll see that I'm active uh, with adoption related entities. Okay. And if, some, if someone in their message to me says, uh, you know, I was referred to you by uh, Ted Smith, who thought that we might connect. I'm a CEO of a nonprofit looking to get into healthcare and whatever, et cetera. I'd love to meet with you. I see that you're involved with uh, MinAdopt. Mm-hmm. I'm an adopted person. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I'll meet with every adopted person. Right. <laughs> and, and it is so much, sometimes those personal, I see that you are also involved in the um, Highland Park girls hockey my daughter is also in the Highland Park girls hockey. I see that you uh, raise standard poodles. Gosh, I have a, you know, honestly, some of those, uh, I'll tell a quick story. Once I was networking, and I had to contact uh, one of the top executives of one of the very largest, I'll say General Mills, mm-hmm. a very large company. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, holy mackerel, you know. <laughs> I'm feeling about an inch tall, and I'm sending out an email, and I don't know the guy, and I've got the world's thinnest connection. Mm-hmm. I had no connection, really, and I needed to network with the guy, and I send this email, and I thought, you know, I got nothing, okay? It would be better to say I've talked to your BFF, Angela Copeland, or gosh, you know, you and I are on the board together. I had nothing. So I looked at the guy's LinkedIn, and I saw he went to Drake University, mm-hmm. and I thought, all right, my daughter went to Drake. It's all I got. So, I, you know, I need to talk with you, and I'd like to network with you. I'm this, that, and the other. P.S., I see that you went to Drake University. My daughter went to Drake University. Mm-hmm. Go Bulldogs, I put in all caps. Mm-hmm. I kid you not, I hear back from the guy in an hour. The first thing he writes, Go Bulldogs, in caps. <laughs> and he took the meeting. So there's the value of looking at someone's bio Yes, I want to make all the professional connections I can. Even if Angela is my referral source, mm-hmm. do you have others? I see that you, um, you know, I see that you live in St. Louis Park. I also live there. I see that you're a member of such and so. I see that you're an alum of University of Iowa. I see that you're, you know, can you make some other connections um, 
with that person. Mm -hmm. Trust me, when you, the more connections you make, you are a kindred spirit and you are not a pest. I totally agree. And actually, it's interesting you mentioned the university connections and the different connections that you can see on LinkedIn because LinkedIn has made it easier and easier like every year to, uh, for example, search for people who went to a certain university who live in your city who work at a particular company. So it's it's a very similar thing, but you can kind of almost reverse engineer it to locate who those people are. Um, mm-hmm. rather than find someone and then look through their bio. You can kind of do it both ways, which I think is is really interesting. Well, you mentioned that mm-hmm. people reach out to you all the time, which is great because you're working in, uh, you know, the executive search space. And if we are interested to work in the civic space and we're currently looking for a job, how would you recommend you know, that we reach out to you. Is it something similar to what you mentioned about the email with the three parts and kind of setting up a meeting? Is that the best way to reach out to you or to a recruiter? Yeah, I think that uh, you know, the good news about, the bad news about contacting search firms as part of one's job transition is that, you know, there's under 5% chance you're going to land your next job through a search firm. And if you do, it's going to be an exhaustive, lengthy, multi-step process. Mm -hmm. But be that as it may, uh, the good news about contacting the search community as part of one's job transition is it takes virtually no time at all. You know, if if you were in the Twin Cities area here or seeking to move here or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, and you had a list of Twin Cities-based search firms that work in this region, uh, the time it takes to cut and paste an email... uh, saying, you know, I'm a 20-year veteran of um, quality improvement programs and I work in the woods industry and I'm looking to do thus and so or whatever, Um, you know, you cut and paste an email about yourself, you know, here's how much I make, here's where I want to live, here's et cetera, and attach your resume, uh, bing, 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 you can contact 45 firms in a half hour Mm -hmm. and you're done. You don't need to meet with us. You don't need to... Oh, that's a good point. You know. Okay. No, we can't meet with everybody who sends us a resume. Mm-hmm. Um, we put you into our active database. We code you in up one side and down the other. Every job you've had, every place you've worked, every credential you've got, where you live, what you make, what you want to do next, your titles, your schools, your credentials. Search firms, you know, we live and die by that type of information. We mm-hmm. don't treat it cavalier. So when you send your materials to a search firm, it gets treated, you know, in that way, going into an active database. And whenever we start a new search, where's the first place we go? We go to our database and say, all right, um, who has this type of background? Who's worked in these like type of companies? Who has this credential? Who's this, that, or the other? It's not the only place we look. It's sort of a minority of how we find candidates, but it's certainly the first place we go. So if you've contacted a search firm with an email and an attached resume, God bless you. You can cross the search firm uh, step off of your list. That's great. So once we've done that, do you ever like for candidates to reach back out to you at some point in the future to keep you updated? Or in your mind, what would be sort of the ideal interaction? Yeah. If you have sent your resume uh, and a thoughtful email, and those documents are thorough and et cetera, um, and they have an acknowledged receipt, um, and, and, you know, excuse the frankness of my response, but <laughs> do you ever call your credit card company and ask if you're still in their database? Okay. Do you ever call your bank and say, you know, I just want to double check that I'm still in the database? That's how often you need to call people in search and say, am I still in your database? Sure, sure. Um, the only time we, I just moved, so I am calling my bank and saying, you know, cheapers, I have an address change or something like that. Mm-hmm. The only time you need to reconnect with the search community is if something very appreciable has changed. You're, you, you got a new job, and now the top of your resume reads differently. You finished a certain certification, and your resume is different. No, Other that- than that, you really don't. Many people do that because, again, it's a tactic to avoid networking. Um, but it is a waste of time. 
Okay. Okay. That's good feedback. That's good feedback. Well, that's s- when you are a pest. That is truly <laughs> a pest. Is calling it someone when you're in the database, you can't be any more in than in. I, I've had one guy, he calls me every three weeks. He's called me every three weeks for the last 20 years to oh. double check that he's still in the database. Oh, wow. He's the king of all pests. Um, but even calling once or twice is being a pest because it's unnecessary. Okay. That's good feedback. Well, so if we're listening today and we're interested to learn more about you, your business, and your book, where should we go? Yeah, thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. The book is available on Amazon uh, in all of the editions that I mentioned, Mm -hmm. and uh, we love staying connected with people who read the book. If you read the book and would like to connect with me via LinkedIn, uh, I value that. If you are in the Twin Cities region and you are in the civic nonprofit sector, uh, you probably have already heard of our firm and um, have connected with us. But if not, and you're new to the conversation, we always value being connected with folks via having them share their resume with us, uh, a call uh, to our firm with a question, or uh, connecting with us via LinkedIn, following our firm on LinkedIn, following our firm on Facebook, or following our firm on Twitter, where we do share all of our open opportunities. Oh, that's perfect. And what is your Twitter handle? Uh, at Ballinger Leaf Lab. Okay, perfect. Well, I will put links to all of this in the show notes so that anyone listening can easily find your information and kind of reach out, uh, whether it's through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, you know, just to, to get in touch, to learn more, and to check out the 20 minute networking meeting. Well, Marcia, thank you so much. This is like my favorite topic. So it's been great to talk with you. Terrific. I enjoyed it very much. And thanks everyone for listening. Thanks to those of you who sent me questions. You can send me your questions to Angela at copelandcoaching.com. You can also send me questions via Twitter. I'm at Copeland Coach. And on Facebook, I'm Copeland Coaching. Don't forget to help me out. Subscribe on iTunes and leave me a review. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.